Great. Thank you, gifted guys in the back for all of your help. The Pastor Austin, thank you for the introduction, and I'm happy to take you out to lunch anytime I'm here in town. It is so neat to be back with you. Um, we've been here uh, enough times, and we come frequently enough that it, to, to us it feels like a homecoming. It feels like coming back to family. And every time we come, it seems more and more like that. So thank you for being you. New Hope is an awesome place to do life and to be you and to grow. So I'm grateful to be here. Uh, last week, Pastor Austin kicked off a uh, sermon series on uh, minor figures in the Bible, uh, what I call bit part players in the Bible. And uh, he did a wonderful job with Jethro Ruel Hobab. And today we're going to continue that series. I've picked one myself. Before we jump into the message, I thought we would do just a little bit of flying around to set the big picture sort of context. So where you are on the screen behind me uh, is five uh, miles above the Earth's surface on a satellite. And so this is a digitized satellite uh, picture that we've turned into a flight module. And if you have your um, uh, trays in the uh, closed, upright, and locked position, then I wanted to share with you, we're at Mount Hermon in the far north of Israel, looking straight down on the ancient city of, right here by the hand, Dan, Don, D-A-N, and what I'd like to do is fly a little bit uh, through the entire land of Israel, so you get a context. Golan Heights on your left, Sea of Galilee in the middle, Galilee itself to the right, flying down the lower Jordan Valley with on your left hand side now Gilead, on your right hand side of the Jordan Valley, Samaria. As we continue southward, headed toward the wilderness, it gets less populated, less rainfall, less vegetation, the further south you go. So now we are on our right hand side. We're uh, looking at Perea, just past the Decapolis back here. Still Samaria here, until just about right here you come to Judea or Judah. Jerusalem is right here. The Jordan River Channel flowing into the Dead Sea right here. Qumran, the place of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, right at the hand here. Ammon on this side, after this big drainage system, Moab, southern Judah here. And so we started in Dan and we're, we have flown all the way to where the hand is right here, Beersheba. So when the Bible talks about, and all Israel knew that Samuel was established as a prophet from Dan even unto Beersheba, it means the whole country, from the far north all the way to the far south. After Beersheba, you are outside of biblical Israel, and we are now in the northern Sinai deserts. You've heard of that Sinai, right? Not cyanide, yes? But Sinai, S-I-N-A-I. Continuing further, another couple of hundred miles, you come to Mount, fill in the blank. Yes, not cyanide, as my students often write. Okay, and there you have in Exodus 19, Exodus 20 and following, the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. Great, all right? So now, in a barren context, in a very desolate situation, the people of Israel are receiving revelation from God at Mount Sinai, and a part of that is the context that provides for us the context of the passages that we're going to want to study today. So uh, let me change gears here just a second. And we have the name of a gentleman that shows up beginning in Exodus 31 and following. And his name only shows up nine times in the whole Bible. He's not a front page figure. He's not a David. He's not a Solomon. He's not a Hezekiah, an Isaiah, a Jeremiah. He's not uh, somebody like Nehemiah or Ezra. This guy's a bit player. He's just playing his part. 
But I, wanna, I hope that you see, as we process through this material today, this is a guy that made a pretty big splash in history, whose works are still being talked about and written about and, um, and movies made about even today. So this guy's name is uh, in, in English, uh, uh, Bezalel or Bezalel or in Hebrew, Bitzalel, Bitzalel. Not sure how to pronounce it in English, but I do know how to pronounce it in Hebrew. I'm wondering if you woke up this morning, got you a couple of cups, cups of coffee under your belt and said, I am really hoping to learn some Hebrew when I go to church this morning. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I'm going to make that a working assumption and we're going to move forward, okay? B, B in Hebrew is a little tiny preposition that can mean in, with, by, at, among, against, or through. But in the, this particular name, it means that first definition that I gave, and that is in. And then tzal is a word that shows up prominently in Psalm 23. Even though I go through the tzal of the shadow of death, the valley of the tzal of death, it, it means shadow or shade or shelter. And then I bet you know what El means, right? Like El Shaddai, right? Yeah? God, capital G, right? Like the God of Israel. So this guy's name in Hebrew means in the shadow of God. Probably insinuated is the one who is dwelling in the shadow of God, meaning in the presence of God. Um, we, can do a, we can skin this, uh, this cat a bunch of different ways, dealing with Bible names or Bible words and their meaning. Most people will pick up a Webster's Dictionary and run to that and try to figure it out via the English. But Daniel Webster wasn't around when Moses was writing. You know, he comes hundreds and hundreds, thousands of years later. And Daniel Webster wrote a great dictionary, but it was for the English language. And most of you know that the Hebrew Bible was written in, hint, hint, yes. And the Greek New Testament was written in, yeah, you guys are so awesome. And quick to pick up, too. So, how about we do this? How about from this point on, we expect of our leaders... We expect of preachers and teachers on Christian TV, we expect of ourselves to let the Bible define its own terms. Is that fair enough? It's like when we sit across a table from somebody we're having lunch with and they use a term that we're not familiar with, some, a word that's not in our vocabulary. What do we usually say? What do you mean by that? So when it's a Bible word, let's let the Bible define its own terms. So I'm going to look at just one book in the Bible to deal with this business of tzal, shade or shelter, shadow. And in Psalm 17, we get, keep me as the apple of the eye. That's where we get that phrase, actually. It comes into the English language. You're the apple of my eye, honey. Um, we get that from the Bible. That's biblical. A little bird told me that's biblical. This stuff comes into the English language via English translations of our Bible. And I think that's pretty neat. Even the secularists are never going to be able to get rid of all of that stuff. I think that's pretty cool. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. Psalm 36. How precious is your we translate it steadfast love or loving kindness or whatever. The Hebrew word there is chesed, and it means God's covenant loyalty. In other words, his faithfulness, his trustworthiness to keep his word, to keep his promises. It's a word that's used most often in the Bible to describe God, actually. God, you know, the God who saved you, the God who provides for and protects you, he is a trustworthy, covenant-keeping God. You can count on him once he's given it to keep his word. How precious is your covenant loyalty, O oh God. And the children of men, people, take refuge in the shadow of your wings. 
Psalm 57, be gracious to me, O God, be gracious to me. My soul takes refuge in you. And in the shadow of your wings, I will take refuge until destruction passes by. And of course, I know that none of this is relevant to anything that we're having to deal with today. And yet the survey says, oh yeah, updated. It's still as relevant as the day that it was written. We're trusting God. And we're trusting to dwell under the shadow, the shelter, the protection of his wings until this business passes by and pass by it will. Psalm 63, for you have been my help and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. And then kind of the crowning glory of this study, I save the best for last, is Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. It's just two ways of saying the same thing. It's like my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus does this as well. So does Paul. So does John the Baptist. So does pretty much everybody in the Bible. This what's called Hebrew poetic parallelism saying the same thing two different ways with two different vocabulary sets. At least at some point we're going to get the point, right? will abide the shelter and the shadow of the Almighty. By the way, I don't know if you noticed this, but even Jesus will say things like from the Mount of Olives as he's approaching Jerusalem for his last visit there. He says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, stoning the prophets and killing those who are sent to you. See the par poetic parallelism? How often would I have gathered you as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and maybe you've noticed this before but and ladies I know you're gonna love this God is often pictured in the Bible both in the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament and in the New Testament as having feminine attributes most often in terms of nurture and protection that sort of thing how often would I have got, uh, gathered you together like a mother hen gathers her brood under her wings and that is for protection when the predator comes around. I will say to the Lord my refuge and my fortress. See all of this it's all expanding on this idea of dwelling in the shadow of the Most High. Dwelling in the shelter of His wings. My refuge and my fortress. My God in whom I trust because it is He who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, which is just an old English word for wings. Under his wings, you will seek refuge. His faithfulness, that covenant loyalty, is a shield and a bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, or of the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. What an awesome passage and totally, yes, relevant for where we are, what we're living through today. Absolutely up to date, God's word for you this morning. Psalm 91, you might want to read the rest of it sometime later on today. By the way, this evening from 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock, we're going to be taking a new and I'm, I, I'm thinking a totally fresh and, and unique look at a parable that you have heard so many times, the parable of the Good Samaritan, but this time in full context, in high def, in 3D, in high resolution, we're going to be putting the, that, that particular parable of Jesus, one of his most famous parables, under the microscope and it will pop. You will see eternal relevance in that parable for you and the way that we live our lives, the way we interact with other people from 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock this evening. I want to encourage you to, to be there for that. We see in this Bitzalel, this one who dwells under the shadow of the wings of the Most High God, we see a man that is called for a specific task. Uh, maybe some of you recognize this. I'm allowed to do this because even though I've retired from full-time professorship, I'm still a professor adjunct and will be teaching a couple of courses this fall uh, when school starts again. So I'm still allowed. It's on my union card. I get to give pop quizzes. There's always payday someday, right? There's always a quiz at the end of the class. So 
we may as well go ahead and get these formalities taken care of. You're familiar with this. See the wilderness background? Yeah? This is the, yes, the tabernacle, the mishkan, built in the wilderness by, who was it? You guessed it, our man, Bitzalel, the one who dwells under the shelter and the shadow of the wings of the Most High. Any of you recognize this picture? Seven branched candle stand that's called in Hebrew the menorah, right. Uh, amazing that this guy from the tribe of Judah, not the tribe of Levi, the, the priestly tribe, is able to make these things and hand them off to somebody else never to be able to handle them again for the rest of his life. A bit player playing his part. How about this? See the fire there in the middle? This is the altar of burnt offering. Exactly. See the poles where the this altar of burnt offering was carried from place to place as the Israelites moved from place to place in the wilderness in their 40 years of wilderness journeying and carried this on their shoulders. But Bitzalel never touched it again. He made it and that was the end of his responsibility for this particular object. How about this? You recognize this kind of, we use the word lavatory place where you wash your hands. We're still using that word today. This is the bronze basin or laver, okay? Also built by your man, Bezalel, the one who dwells in the shadow of the Most High. Nobody knows what this is, do you? Saved one of the best for last. The Ark of the Covenant. Movies still being made about this thing. Made by your man, Bezalel never to touch it again. Even the clothing, the priests, for the priests and for the Levites, made by the hands of, yeah, Bezalel. This guy even made these little golden bells. My friend Eli Shukron on the left, holding this bell found in a storm drain underneath first century Jerusalem in a crack between two stones as he's excavating that filled up with, you know, silted up uh, storm drain. And in the right hand side, he's holding it in his fingers. It's that small. A golden bell with a little tiny clapper that can still be heard if you shake it on the inside. And on the bottom right, you see this golden bell against the black background. And there's a little tiny loop at the top for a little tiny piece of thread to be sewn through and into the garment on the high priest's robe. This is the only thing that we have that we know was once at one point in the Holy of Holies on the high priest's garment and on the Day of Atonement. Isn't that amazing? Thousands of years later, and this was found by Ailey Shukron in 2011. We've had it in our possession now for nine years. If this is news to you, that's okay. We can't know everything, but isn't that cool? Come on, guys, go ahead and give it up. This is really awesome. Well, I hope at some point as we're doing our study in Israel, we'll run across Ailey. He's often out in the field, and we'll get, get, get him to uh, give you a little impromptu lecture and sign some uh, autographs and give a hug. Where does all this stuff come from? How do I know about the tabernacle being built and about the bronze lava and about the menorah and uh, uh, about the uh, other things, the priestly garments? Well, it says here in the book of Exodus, chapter 31, now Yahweh, and we know that that's what lies behind the words in English if it's in all capital letters, L-O-R-D. That's the translator's cue to, to us guys that behind the English, if it's all caps like this, it's the, it's the divine name of God, Yahweh. So there's a little bit more Hebrew that you can learn uh, today. Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, See, I have called you by, called by name Bitzalel, the one who dwells in the shadow of the Most High. The son of Uri, meaning my light is Yahweh, and the son of Hur, do you remember this guy? 
He was one of the guys that was holding up one of the arms of Moses so that Israel could continue to defeat their enemies. Aaron and Hur, remember? H-U-R. So this guy comes from a pretty cool lineage, and yet he doesn't get the press that Aaron and that Hur and the other guys do. You are all kinds of sermons about those guys, but Bitzalel, well, you probably are hearing it first here. Thanks for getting us started, Pastor. Uh, we appreciate that. And I've called him from the tribe of Judah, not the priestly tribe, the tribe of Judah, to make the tent of meeting, that's code for tabernacle, and the ark and the mercy seat and the table of showbread, the golden lampstand, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering, the bronze laver, the holy garments for Aaron and the, the priest and, and, and his sons, the anointing oil and even the fragrant incense that is burnt with the burnt offerings on the altar. There's, the, there's your laundry list right there. It's all those pictures we looked at. That was your buddy Betzalel who had his hand to the plow making those things. He was a craftsman. He was a worker bee. He was a regular old eight to five, punch the clock Joe. Isn't that neat? That God would use somebody like that for these important things that we even talk about today. He was also a man of God who was empowered by God to fulfill his calling. And I want to drill down on this point right now because people all across this auditorium from all works of life like, uh, for example, educators or mechanics or bus drivers or greeters at Walmart or teachers or whoever, God made you uniquely you. God gifted and talented you uniquely. God opened up a series of doors and opportunities from your family of origin all, through, all the way through your educational system, through your life experiences and stuff, and then he opened up a door for you to walk into the exact puzzle piece that you play in life right now. God did that. God did that. He called you to this station, this situation in life. It might be a stay-at-home mom. It could be a stay-at-home dad for that matter. God's calling you and opening the doors and giving opportunity and then uniquely fitting you right into your place in life. But that's not all. If that was all, it would just be, well, okay, thanks for dumping on me, God. But God doesn't do like that. He doesn't roll that way. Whatever God calls you to, if it's to help serve and, and, and feed the homeless, whether it's maybe helping in the nursery, as we heard about earlier, or in pre-K or whatever, you, we're hearing about a God who not only calls, but he is also willing to empower. He wants to empower us. If we expect to be called by God and then go and get that done, whatever God calls us to do, and our own strength, I can assure you that there's weariness and frustration and discouragement in your future because he's never going to call us to simple, easy, you can get that done by your own creativity and your own wisdom and your own connections. Uh, he's calling us to extraordinary lifestyle, first of all, not everybody's anteing up for what we bought into here. Serving God, uh, turning the other cheek, living our lives like the Jesus that we see in the Gospels. That's an, a high and unusual calling, right? Don't expect to get that done in your own strength. This can only come by the enablement, the empowerment of God. That's the way he intends it to be. He never set it up for you to have to do his will and your limited strength or wisdom or creativity. Never intended it for it to happen that way. He wants to partner with us. He wants to divinely enable us to accomplish the stuff that he's called us to do, to be that puzzle piece that he has created us to be and gifted us to be and opportunity to us to be and placed us into that puzzle, that unique puzzle piece that you play, that you play, that God's called you to. He's got a divine enablement, an empowerment for it. And it doesn't just come once. 
It's not a one-time trip to the altar any more than it's a one-time fill-up in our car. That's why Paul says in Ephesians 5.18, be continually filled with God's Holy Spirit. Yes? It's a constant empowerment. Lord, enable me, empower me, renew your anointing on my life, renew your uh, divine enablement for today's tasks, for today's challenges, for today's responsibilities. And there's a God who is covenantally faithful who's going to meet you in that. And as you open up, he's going to fill. It's exactly that way that he intended for this thing to, to run. Take a look at this passage. I intentionally skipped over this part of Exodus 31, intending to come back to it now. Exodus 31, See, I have called Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God. It's not good enough to be called unless you just want to be miserable and frustrated and discouraged and defeated. You've got to be empowered. There's got to be a continual flow of God's gas into our tank for us to continue down the road and represent Him and touch people for Him and draw them to Him. To live a life that is a life that is a life of abundance. We can be miserable. We can slug through life step after step, dragging ourselves out of bed on Monday morning and trying to fake our way through work until 5 p.m. and then go do what we really like to do. Or we can just, everybody's working for the weekend, you know, and we can live two days a week. But that's not what God called us to. He called us to abundant life 24-7, seven days a week, 365 days a year to live life abundantly. Not just touching bases, not just trying to stay out of trouble with our boss or our spouse, but living life abundantly. Do you know that 70% of Americans despise their jobs? I wonder why that would be. Lack of empowerment. Lack of that daily, regular, divine enablement. A lot of people are feeling frustrated, feeling defeated, feeling discouraged, wanting to change jobs, this, that, and the other. How about we take it in another direction and whatever God calls us to, let him empower us to be the best whatever that puzzle piece is, whatever you are, the best one that you can be, to be the most productive, to do the best job, to produce the best product. What, what, what kind of witness would that be? What would that look like if we have a whole body of Christ empowered like that? It would change communities. It would change the dynamics in our home, change the dynamics in our marriage, change the dynamics in this entire society. That's exactly what God's plan is. That's the way he wants to roll through you and through New Hope and out into Urbandale and the greater Des Moines area. I filled him with the Spirit of God. It's not just us going out and doing his will in our strength. That's a guaranteed equation for weariness. Look, Paul talks about this. This is not something unique to the book of Exodus or the Old Testament or, yeah, well, that was 3,400 years ago. Well, Paul talks about it, you know, 1,400 years later. And the New Testament, this book that we're getting ready to read, Colossians, that's in there for a reason. That's the word of God for us today. Look, the grass withers and the flower fades. All flesh is grass, but God's word stays the same forever, Isaiah 40 says. So what Paul wrote in the first century is still echoing down through the halls of time to the 21st century. And this is God's word to us today. And he says this, I am praying that you, and the you is plural there, y'all. Again, if you look in the King James, it's, it's Y-E, ye. May be, may be able to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. That's a good witness. That's a solid witness out there. When you're with your ball team or you're at work, uh, you're working on some kind of a you know, volunteer project or whatever, the witness that's going forth from your life is a good witness. That's what Paul is saying. I'm praying that you might walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, representing him well, reflecting his nature and his character accurately in every respect, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. And you're going, 
Yeah, but all that does is raise the bar. All, all that's done is, 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 is raise the standard of expectation, okay? And you're right. But look at verse 11. Here comes the good news. Strengthened with all power. Strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, not our limited ability. And there it is. There's the good news. Yes, it's a high bar. Yes, there's high expectation of this God who gave His only Son for you and me. You know, the one that came that we might live life and live it abundantly. Yes, of course, there is a high bar. He lived a high bar. But can I tell you this? It's not about you getting over that bar in your own strength. It's all about yielding to God, being a receptacle, being willing, being available, and saying, God, on a regular base, enable me. Divinely empower me. Pour your spirit into and then through me out into my world, into my family, into my community, into my workplace, into my ball team. Pour your, pour your power out through me into the classroom where I'm a student. Use me. Flow through me. Empower me to live the way that you've called me to live. And I'm telling you, this is reality. This is not make-believe. This is right where the rubber meets the road. God calls a regular old workaday Joe, and he puts before him an impossible task. This guy has got to be able to thread a needle, but he's also got to be a blacksmith. He's got to be able to work from daylight until dark. He's also got to be able to work with other people, and we hear about it if you go back to Exodus 31 and following. He brings in other folks who have other skills and other talents. He brings in people that he can delegate responsibilities to, and he's not even challenged. He's not threatened by, oh, well, this guy works with gold a whole lot better than I do. You know, because when you're filling that puzzle piece that God's called you to fill, and when you're empowered by His Spirit, enabled on a regular basis, on a daily basis by His Spirit, you don't have to feel threatened about other people's talents. It's one of the reasons why in the early church, Paul says to the, first, to the uh, people at, at the, in the city of Corinth, he says, all of these gifts of the Spirit, they're all supposed to work together. It's not supposed to be any competition. Not competition, it's supposed to be cooperation. All these various gifts of the Spirit are supposed to function in the body of Christ to build up the entire, the whole, and work together. Not trying to override each other, not trying to make a name for, not trying to sandbag a position. Too often in workplaces, we want to hire people that are just like us. That's not going to get the job done because that's just, they're just more clones of you. In pastoral positions, oh, well, I want folks that have my same skill set. I don't want anybody to get above me. That's, that's not going to get the job done either. It's important to be able to integrate other people into the work of God, to be able to, um, to, to, be able to delegate responsibilities to other people and to embrace those people for who God has created them to be. Whatever that talent is, whatever that skill is, whatever that gift happens to be, working together, not against each other, not in co competition. This is exactly what Paul is talking about here. In 1 Corinthians, with the gifts of the Spirit, yes, that everything be done to edify, to build up the entire body of Christ. In this kind of way, you can be an auto mechanic. You can be a greeter at Walmart. You can be a Sunday school teacher. You can be a volunteer for feeding the homeless. You can be whatever, any part, any of those puzzle pieces, whatever God's created you to be and fit you in, well, it's not just about missionaries. It's not just about pastors. It's not just about worship leaders, professors. This is for everybody. This is for every man, woman, and child in God's family. Peter puts it like this in one of his letters in the New Testament. And the Protestant Reformation that happened 500 years ago was based largely on this passage right here. It's not just about monks and bishops and archbishops and priests. Everybody in the body of Christ has been called to be a minister called by God 
to be a priest, a representative to the world that we're a part of. Peter says this, but you, and this is plural again, and it's also in the general epistles, meaning it's not written to some pastor like Timothy or Titus. This is written to the body of Christ as a whole or at large. You are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You hear this? He's saying it to you. This is your letter. It's not just somebody special's letter. This is your letter. This is God speaking directly to you and me. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And this is not even new with Peter. We hear about this from Moses. God tells Moses in Exodus 19, we're back at Sinai, we're back at the giving of the law. Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, you are a kingdom of priests to me. The entire nation, not just Moses, not just Aaron, not just the Levites, the whole nation of ancient Israel are supposed to be functioning as a kingdom of priests to this God. To whom? The rest of the world. Any other non-Israelite. You're supposed to be reflecting my nature, reflecting my attributes, reflecting my character, reflecting my glory. We're going to hear more about this tonight with the parable of the Good Samaritan. Reflecting the glory of God to the people outside the covenant. To do what? To show them who God is and who they can be as they are drawn to God, as they submit to his rule in their lives, as they begin to reflect the nature, the character, the attributes of this incredible God that we have the privilege of serving as priests. Pretty high calling, huh? Pretty high bar? But again, it's not about you. Oh my goodness, now I've just got more on my plate. Now I've just got more to think about, more to worry about, more to fail in when I go out there this way. No, the God who calls is also the God who, I want to hear you say it, the God who empowers, the God who gives us his divine enablement. That's the kind of God that has called us and that's the kind of God that you serve as priests under, that you represent to your world. So whatever it is, whatever puzzle piece that you are uh, performing, whatever responsibility, wherever God has fit you in, whatever walk of life, whatever your particular altar looks like, whether it's a, it's a lathe or it's a computer terminal or it's behind a broomstick, would you join with me? Would you stand up? And let's commit to God to live out this high calling, but to to promise ourselves and God, I'm not going to try to do your will in my strength. I'm going to look to you on a regular basis to empower me to live this life out. And it's not go it's going to be, our lives are going to be like the, li the life of Bezalel. That fruit will endure. It'll continue. Down through the pages of time, this guy's works are still being celebrated, even in the Indiana Jones movies. So also will yours be. It's not a time to, to retreat, guys. It's not a time to hide behind four walls. Let's take this time that COVID has given us an opportunity to press in and to really know God. That's what you're going to have to do if you're going to be a priest. Let's, gonna pre let's press in to know God. Let's get equipped with his word. Let's get empowered by his spirit and let's go forth and represent him. Pray with me if you would. Father, in Jesus' name, we're asking you to meet us and to use us and to equip us, to empower us with the strength that comes by the infilling of your spirit to be the people that you've called us to be, to, to fit right in exactly where you've put us, to be the puzzle piece you've made us to be and to do it to your glory in your strength. And we ask it in the mighty name of your son, Jesus. Amen and amen.